Well, welcome everyone. Wow. See everyone. Uh, thank you all for uh, showing up this evening to my keynote, Crash and Burn, my 10 favorite security failures. Welcome to everybody online who uh, is joining us remotely. My name is Mark Orlando. Um, and tonight, I will be taking you along on an autobiographical journey through some of my personal favorite security failures. And perhaps the biggest challenge in putting together this talk was deciding out of the many different options I had, which ones I felt were most useful to all of you, um, maybe most entertaining, the most interesting. And then I thought, okay, out of those maybe 500, which 10 would fit kind of the best? So uh, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you uh, are at least entertained, uh, even if you don't maybe learn a little something from, from my mistakes. Uh, so a little bit of background on me. I've got about 21 years of experience in cybersecurity, specifically in defense. So building and working in and leading and assessing cybersecurity teams. When I'm not here working for SANS and teaching classes, that's what I'm doing in my day job. I have a cybersecurity firm, it's called Bionic. And this is what we do. We help organizations defend themselves, build out cybersecurity capabilities. Uh, of course, I am a certified instructor and a course author at SANS. I teach our SEC 450 course, which is Blue Team Fundamentals and Security Operations. I'm the co-author of Management 551, which is Building and Leading Security Operations. So I've been doing this for quite some time, I've kind of worked my way up from being a SOC analyst, working in an operations center myself, up through being a team lead, being a manager, an executive, and now a, a startup founder and an instructor. And you know, one of the things I've learned throughout this process is that even as you gain experience and as you become slightly more senior in, in what you're doing, you gain expertise, you, know, you never stop making mistakes, right? You never stop making mistakes they just get bigger and people become more disappointed that you're making them and more people become more disappointed that you're making them. I find that that's really the big difference that comes with uh, experience, comes with age uh, in the industry. So anyway, I've picked out my, my 10 favorite security failures and that's what we're going to talk about. And I've been wanting to give a talk like this actually for quite some time because I truly believe that failures are the best teachers, right? Mistakes are the best teachers. And I think they're also something that in security, we spend so much time talking about like best practices and frameworks and the right way to do things. And I think there's certainly a place for that. In fact, that's what I'm spending a lot of my daylight hours this week doing is talking about what really works. But that's not what we're gonna talk about tonight. We're gonna talk about things that didn't work. So my first favorite fail that I wanna to talk to you all about, this fail I like to call no is not an option, right? And if this were a video game, you might be presented with this dialogue screen. Oh no, oops. You thought the president of the United States cared about your internet access policy. In retrospect, clearly a mistake. So, you all will come along on a journey with me back to 2008. Get a phone call from a former colleague asking if I would be willing to come in and take a meeting, see about maybe going to build the first 24 by 7 security operations center um, at the White House. Pretty easy answer. Yeah, of course. I remember calling my girlfriend at the time and saying, I can believe this. But I just got asked to, you know, maybe go in and build a SOC. The executive office of the president. She was like, that's great. Executive office of the president of, of what? And I was like, of the United States. And she was like, oh my God. And I was like, I know. Couldn't be cool about it. So I took the meeting. I got the job. Put together a really great team. And we built out the SOC. Again, this was like 2008 time frame. Okay, so we built out the security operations team, very exciting time. And then we get to presidential transition. Right? Remember 2008 is when 
Bush administration is leaving office. The Obama administration is coming in. A very exciting time. And if you've never been through a presidential transition on that side of things, imagine an environment where literally 90% of the users change overnight. And I don't mean it changes really fast. I mean, literally a bunch of them leave one day and a whole different group of people come in the next day. So there's a lot of transformation, a lot of shift that comes along with that. So we've been up and running for a little while at this point. Our policies, our processes kind of were what they were. They were somewhat well-established at that point. And imagine if you will, different kind of candidate coming into office, right? Someone who had inspired millions of people who, who campaigned on a platform of change and, and transformation, who you know, ran a very successful campaign in large part due to his use of social media right? and engaging with the public online, right? Using some of those channels. And now this candidate, right? It's now the president has brought in this really savvy, young, high-tech team to further his agenda in office using some of the same tools right, that got them there in the first place. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, right? engaging directly with the American public. Really exciting stuff. Very cool. Just one slight wrinkle. First couple of days that the team assumes their new posts, the new administration takes office, they realize they can't access a lot of these websites. So, of course, I sit down with the president. I sit down with a representative, well, okay, that's not true either, about six representatives of the representative of the representative, right? It's actually uh, part of the president's new media staff, right? Brand new team stood up to, to do the kind of work that we're talking about. And they say, hey, looks like we're blocked from a lot of these websites. We have a lot of things that we're trying to do. We've got YouTube stuff coming up, live streams. We've got you know, new media, like online campaigns and things. And can't get to any of these websites. And I start to say the sentence, well, that's not a mistake. Those sites are all blocked because, because of like the Presidential Records Act and because of security concerns, you can't actually access those from here. And I think I, I, think I almost got that sentence out of my mouth, almost. In fact, I think I probably got, you can't out of my mouth before I got the, I'm gonna stop you right there. Because you seem to be confused about what the purpose of this meeting is. You think, this is the person talking to me, you think that this is a meeting where you tell me why I can't get to this site. I don't care about any of that. It sounded like you're about to explain to me why that's just the way it is. I don't really care about that so much either. What I care about, and the reason we're talking right now is because I just need to know how fast this is gonna get fixed. And if maybe I need to have one of the literal multitudes of people come in, start taking your paycheck and sit in your chair and fix this for me faster than you're going to do it. And I said, okay, listen, we got off on the wrong foot. I said some things, you said some things. I don't really know what happened there, but the bottom line is we'll have this fixed for you ASAP. And they said, fantastic, that's what I wanted to hear. So we went back, talked to my team, right? Of course, we had to do things legally. The Presidential Records Act actually says that, you know, among other things, any communications that happen in the executive office, right? If we all worked in the executive office doing various things, all of our emails, any memos we write, any documents we produce, all of those things are pre presidential records. And as such, they have to be captured, copied, documented, archived, shipped off to NARA, the National Archives at the end of the administration. We just finished doing that for the previous administration. So we had some of these very real requirements, right, that we cared about. And of course that we knew the administration, you know, wanted to be on the right side of things. So we went, we took a couple of hours, we rebuilt like, brand new profiles in our web proxies and all of our security devices to say, okay, you know what, for this group, these people, 
you can access these websites. Maybe you can't do a few of these things that we're kind of concerned about, sharing files and things like that. But for the most part, you can do what you need to do, right? We found a way, we came up with a solution and everything was great. Now, that could have been a much more painful lesson for me. But what I learned in that, maybe arguably what I should have learned long before then, was that in security, we're decision support, we're problem solvers, we're you know, people who need to come up with solutions. No is not really an option. And it's not our job to say no, necessarily, usually, right? We're also not quite as valuable to the bottom line as we often like to think we are, right? There's a, a quote that I really like that I always think of that always sticks in my head, which is from one of the original Matrix movies where Neo meets up with the architect, right? The architect says, well, we need you to stay alive. And so that's why we keep you around. And Neo's like, well, what if we just all die? Then where will you be, right? And the architect says, without missing a beat, well, you know what? There's a level of survival we're willing to accept. And Neo's like, oh, guess I wasn't as poor as I thought I was. And I always think about with security, you know what? There's a level of security we're willing to accept. And it doesn't have to be as perfect as you think it has to be, right? So something to keep in mind, we're decision support, we're problem solvers. That's our job, not to say no. That kind of leads me to my next favorite fail. So we're gonna go back slightly further in history here, slightly further in, in my own personal history. Uh, this is about 2002 timeframe. At this point, I'm working at the Pentagon, I'm working for the US Army, and we're providing security monitoring and incident response for the Pentagon Backbone Network, right? And at the Pentagon, we have a lot of different tenants, big giant office building, right? In fact, I think at least at the time, I'm not sure if this is still true, largest non-high-rise office building in the world. I must've heard that a million times in the Pentagon tour, right? A lot of different people, a lot of tenants, a lot of service agencies. You got all the military branches, joint staff, various other groups. Those are all our tenants. They're our clients. So our job was to monitor this backbone network, find bad things that are happening, document those and send them to those tenants, to their security teams to say, hey, we have an issue. We see you know, the bad traffic going back and forth. You've got something you need to go take care of, right? They take over and they go take care of it. Now our team was pretty good, pretty good. Some of the smartest people I've ever worked with were on that team. Brilliant, brilliant team of people. Also me. Really capable team, good technology. So we had things pretty well locked down in the sense that you know, we were getting really detail oriented about what we were seeing on the network. We were really kind of getting you know, very particular about what we liked to see in the environment and what we didn't like to see in the environment. And one of the things that kept popping up right, as we started to address some of the big issues and we kind of took care of those, now you know, we we're focused on some of the little kind of nitpicking issues. And one of those issues was vulnerable software. And if you've ever done any kind of network monitoring or network security monitoring, there are certain kinds of uh, logs, certain types of data you can get off of the network that tells you what type of applications your users are using to get to the internet, right? So we had access to that data and we were seeing people would use, you know, they had, uh, this was again, early 2000s. So you had Apple iTunes and QuickTime and other, you know, software people would just install on their, on their desktops or what have you. You would see these applications calling out to the internet, doing you know whatever it is they do, syncing libraries and what what uh, what have you. And you could also see what versions of the software it was. So we started to realize that there were all these users on the Pentagon network, and not only were they installing these kind of questionably not really business related applications like iTunes on their work machines, but there were a lot of vulnerabilities in the software. And we one day decided that we had had enough, enough. And not on my watch. We're not gonna have vulnerable iTunes in the Pentagon while I'm here. We're gonna get rid of that quick time right now. So we decided 
to start opening up cases and opening up tickets to escalate vulnerable versions of software, start blasting them out all over the Pentagon to these teams. Go take care of it. Go chase it down. Here's 50 instances of vulnerable software. Go fix it. We wanted to drive that metric down into the ground, take it down to zero. So we fired off all these cases. And then we didn't hear anything about it for a while. And we thought, that's great. They're actually fixing these issues. That's not what was happening. What was happening is we had escalated these things over to these teams. And then they were escalating up to their management. And then their management was going over to our management. And then it was coming down to us, right? Kind of like in uh, Indiana Jones when he's running away from the boulder, right? Only we were just sitting in a desk chair and we had no idea that the boulder was behind us until it smashed into us. And our bosses called us in and said, hey, stop doing that. Don't do that again. We don't care about vulnerable iTunes. One of those boxes was Admiral so-and-so. And trust me, he doesn't care that he installed QuickTime and iTunes on his workstation and you don't like that very much. So what did I learn here? What did I learn? Aside from not to be passive aggressive in your incident response, I learned that you can't drive security metrics or you shouldn't try to drive security metrics all the way to zero or to 100, right? Security is not absolute. Everybody has a threat model, right? You got to know what that threat model is, know what's really important and work from there. You can't chase down every little piece of even the most slightly vulnerable software in your environment if it doesn't make sense to use your resources that way. Right? Security is a cost, and therefore it's a compromise. So you have to focus on the things that are really important, the things that the organization is actually going to care about. This is a big one for me. And it's one that I came to very early in my career and then again much later in my career. So we're going to go back even further now to 2001 my first kind of cybersecurity job. I worked actually right up the road here at a startup. And the startup was a managed security service provider. And in the early 2000s, the MSSP space was like really hot and scrappy. And it was like innovative. Right? We're offering security as a managed service. And a lot of people didn't really know how to do security. So that was kind of a cool thing. And this was definitely a startup atmosphere. We were sort of figuring things out working with a lot of really smart people. We had some cool new technology. And what we would do is we would have customers sign up. And at the time we were very successful. A lot of customers were, were signing on to the service, this brand new thing that we were building. And we would send them an intrusion detection system, this new kind of technology that was kind of like a network, uh, you know, data flight recorder kind of thing, right? In fact, the company we used was Network Flight Recorder. So we'd send them these boxes. The boxes would start sending us you know, signal, sending us logs and alerts. We would look at those alerts and then we would call the client whenever we saw something that was concerning, okay? These days it's fairly mundane kind of security work, but at the time it was pretty cool. But I started realizing as a junior analyst there that a lot of the alerts we were seeing and that we were escalating was the same alerts every day every week, day in and day out. And at one point, I distinctly remember turning to a colleague and saying, I already escalated this to this customer like 20 times already in the last two months. Do I really need to keep telling them that this is a problem? And he looked at me and he said, yes, yes, keep calling them as many times as you can. We wanna bother them as much as we can until they fix it, make that go away. But what I learned in doing that, right, or the lesson, came about a year later when some of these contracts started coming to a close. And some of the customers that had been so enamored with this new technology and this new service, you know, realized that, you know, are you doing stuff for me day in and day out? Eh, sure, I guess. Right? But you're so focused on just doing that one repetitive thing every day, that I don't really know what you're bringing to me in terms of value. Like, where are we going with this? Right? Where are we going with this? We were prioritizing like quick wins, near-term wins, near-term success 
without long-term strategy, without any higher level goals? What were we really doing for these customers? So there's a, a great quote by Peter Drucker, who's a management consultant, kind of legendary you know, management expert. It says that management is about doing things right while leadership is about doing the right things. So we were doing the right things day to day, but without any like long-term strategic goal or you know, bigger value that we were bringing to those customers, we weren't able to really tell a compelling story about what security was doing for them. And that's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. So we fixed that, and I learned that lesson and applied it later. Right? But it was an important lesson. Now, the flip side of this coin, you can't have management only without strategy to go with it. But we also can't have strategy without management, which is the next kind of favorite fail of mine. Uh-oh. You forgot to pay attention to the day-to-day -day execution. You were looking way out into the sunset where you were going to ride off to. And you forgot that your horse was sick and dying. You're never going to get there. So fast forward several years, jumping back all the way past the White House and the executive office, all the way past the Pentagon. Right now I'm at another startup and we're building another kind of brand new service. This time it's proactive threat hunting as a service, right? So slightly different spin on MSSPs. So this time I'm more of a executive kind of position at this new startup. I'm in a director role, moving up into kind of a CTO role. And so I've built out this team. I've defined kind of how this service works. We brought in our first few customers. We're like building the airplane as it's going down the runway. It's really exciting. And I pick someone I trust and I say, you're going to run daily operations. You're going to make sure that this thing takes off. And I'm going to go focus on strategic things like getting new customers, which we need to fund the business, you know, defining kind of how this service works long-term, you know, helping to get us more funding, that kind of thing. I thought we were all set. But then it turns out that person that I trusted started driving the team really, really hard. Turns out a little too hard. The wrong people start quitting and leaving. And guess who's not paying attention to day-to-day -day execution anymore? Right? So we start having all of these problems and I'm not realizing that people are getting stressed out and burned out trying to keep these customers happy, trying to keep this thing going, right? And what I learned here is that Strategy and management, hey, they're both equally important, right? That daily execution, those are like links that you're building in a chain. Can't build a chain without those strong links, one after another after another. Similarly, without that quality day-to-day -day execution, we're never going to get where we're trying to go. So we have to focus on management as well as strategy. If we don't do that, you start running into what I call the superhero problem. You're going to have people that are going to step up and they're going to try to help make you successful, but at great personal cost right, to whoever's doing that. Maybe it's you. So you have to focus on quality data execution in addition to strategy. Shorter fail, I promise, is a situation that I encountered more recently in uh, my capacity as you know, co-founder of this company, Bionic. We often work with various organizations, different companies, government agencies, try to help them make good decisions about security, do a lot of advising and consulting. And last year, my team worked with a fairly large financial services firm to try to help them compare and select uh, some core security technology, their security information and event management system, their SIM. They said, we don't like what we have. We know all of these things are really expensive, so we need you to help us pick the best one. So a couple members of my team went in, a couple of my consultants, they met with the client, and they started using a lot of words. Words like best of breed. Words like uh, next gen and leading edge. Words like magic, quadrant, 
right? We quickly realized that, you know, this customer has some money to spend. They have some budget, but their team, they're really junior. They're really junior. And they have a very specific kind of tool set and kind of infrastructure where, you know, a lot of these kind of best in class or best of breed tools, right? Top of the market, those might not be the best fit for them. Might be a little bit overkill, might not work very well with the rest of their environment. Their people might not be able to leverage all the features of those tools. So what we quickly learned then, and, and honestly, you know, I've encountered similar scenarios in the past, is rarely is there a, a true best solution. It's really more about best fit. And sometimes I think in our industry and in security, we get such tunnel vision about like what's the coolest, best, most advanced, most sophisticated. And you know, we forget that really the right answer, if somebody asks you, hey, I'm trying to buy this kind of tool. What's the best one out there? What's the real answer? Any guesses? It depends. It depends. Right? So like any good consultant, we said, well, it depends. We did a more kind of focused analysis, selected tools that you know, realistically, they could they could get the most value out of, even if they weren't the most sophisticated, you know, cutting edge kind of tools. And one of those is the one that we recommended. Okay. So we're going to talk about surprises here in a minute. Normally, I really like surprises, but you know who doesn't like surprises ever? Your boss doesn't like surprises. Okay. Before we get there, quick recap. Best isn't always the best, right? It's about best fit. It's about being a good partner and helping someone, you know, get as much value as they can out of a solution. You can't have strategy without management. You can't have management without a strategy. Where are you going, right? We don't want to drive security metrics all the way to 100 or all the way to zero. It's not probably a realistic goal. And no is not an option. No is not an option. So let's talk about surprises for a minute. No one in security likes a surprise, including your customer, including, including your boss, whoever it is you answer to. I'm going to take you back to the Pentagon for this one. This one I really like because it was so cringy and awkward. It just makes me laugh to think about it now. So you may have heard about this Pentagon team, brilliant people. Brilliant team, also me. We were doing some pretty good work, but we felt like, you know what? We can do better. We can do better. We can always do better. So we reached out to an expert, someone who has published books on network security monitoring, someone who's written a lot about the topic, who's done a lot of consulting, done a lot of work in this, in this area. And we brought this person in and said, hey, can you assess our operation and, and tell us you know, where you think we can improve. So we do that. It's a great engagement. We get some really good recommendations, right? This person actually identifies a lot of different places where you know, we thought we were pretty strong, but of course we can improve. Not quite as strong as we thought. So he submitted our report. I look at it. It's great. My boss looks at it. Very happy. So we take that report. We schedule a meeting with his boss. This is someone who's an SES, right? which means they really don't like surprises and they can really make your life hard if you forget that. Okay? Really high up, very senior person. So we sit down with this person. We bring our consultant in, in that first meeting. We're like, boss is boss. This is consultant. He has some things he wants to share with you. We think you'll like what he's come up with. Spoiler alert, she did not like what he came up with. Why? Because we brought her into the meeting cold. She knew we were having an assessment, didn't know anything else about it. And now she's hearing from someone she doesn't know in front of her team who she's paying to do a job. Here are all the things that your people are doing that really are not as great as they could be. And it wasn't on that consultant for how he delivered his very blunt input. Well, they're not doing this. You're not doing this. You should be doing this. 
you seems like somebody is forgetting to do this. Right? And she stops the meeting halfway through. And she tells a consultant to go stand outside. And I got probably the worst dressing down I had received since being in the Marine Corps prior to my InfoSec career. It was awesome, but also it was terrible. It's not good, right? Why? Because we are in the business in security of telling people things that they don't know, they probably don't wanna hear in some cases. And those stakeholders, your boss and other stakeholders, your chain of command, those important people, they get those details first, right? And they get those details couched in enough information and enough detail and enough context that they understand kind of where you're coming from, why they should care, why it's not necessarily you know, a failure that you've identified some things that could be improved, right? Humans don't generally take bad news very well. So communication skills are critical, giving people a heads up, about what they're about to hear and why, also critical. That's what I learned in that situation. Next favorite fail, running the numbers. Oh no, you tried to manage using only the data, only the metrics, thinking that those are the only things that matter. Those are the most important things in security, right? For this one, we're going back to the White House. So now we're a few years in. We've worked out that whole misunderstanding about internet access policies and social media. Things are going pretty smoothly, pretty smoothly. Some of you may not know this, but the executive office of the president is actually several different agencies, or it includes several other different agencies under the executive office. You've got the office of the vice president, of course, but you also have the office of management and budget, OMB, massive agency. You've got uh, the US trade representative, and several other kind of smaller subgroups within that EOP uh, agency. And the EOP is not a traditional federal agency um, in the sense that the budgetary process is not like all of the other agencies where the budget gets drawn up and approved and then the money gets doled out, right? The EOP has to go directly to Congress and plead for their budget separately which means there's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure to justify who gets what resources and how much. And this certainly applies to cybersecurity. So I was getting a lot of pressure and my team was getting a lot of pressure to make the numbers look good, make our reports look good. So we had like vulnerability reports and dashboards and incident reports for all of these different groups. We had to go you know, make nice and try to convince them to come along. And hey, don't you really wanna patch the vulnerable software? It would really make my life easier. Thank you so much, right? Really try to get them to come along. And every day we were just getting hammered. You know, these reports look terrible. It doesn't look like we're using what we have. How am I gonna like, argue for more budget and more support? This is what we're getting. What happens when people at the top of the organization get stressed out, start pressuring people? It starts rolling downhill, right? So I'm calling my people into the conference room. I'm saying, why do these numbers look like they do? This is Bush League, people. Right? We can't have critical vulnerabilities open for a month. OMB can't take two weeks to get back to us on some critical incident that we've reported to them. We can't take four days to review a very simple change request. I have to wear a suit all the time. I'm taking the Metro to work. We work in a skiff, there are no windows. This is my default way of talking now. It's a very stressful time. But I was getting so wrapped up in the numbers and the figures and the data and the metrics, right? That I was using those as a replacement for good management, and in some cases, let's be honest, good judgment, right? Metrics and data are really important. They're important in technology, they're important in security, okay? But they are just that, they're data points. They don't replace domain expertise, they don't replace management skills, they don't replace you know, experience. So tying incentives, punishments, only to the metrics can guarantee 
that people are going to game the metrics. So guess what happened in my White House scenario? I hammered on my team enough and I was hammered on enough that suddenly, magically, the numbers started to get better. Now, do you think that's because people just finally started to get it and go along? Or do you think that's because the definition of what is really an incident started to magically kind of shift? The definition of what is really a critical vulnerability, uh, maybe, maybe we were wrong about that. Maybe, uh, maybe our new SLA is uh, 30 days. Suddenly the red becomes green. Numbers look a lot better. I'm not saying that we did that. I'm saying hypothetically, that's the kind of thing that happens. No, but if you tie those metrics, if you tie data to incentives, to punishments, if you try to manage that way, people are going to game the system. And there are examples of that all over, not just in technology, not just in security, right? But they're a tool. They're not a replacement for management. Coming into the home stretch here, fail number eight, another one of my favorites. Pictures without purpose. I leaned in too far on data visualization. How many of us love a good pew pew map or a chart or a picture? So much, right? So cool. Love the visualizations. So um, about 20, 2011, 2011, 2012 timeframe. Um, coming out of my time, my stint at the executive office, I get asked to go build out and, and manage another security team. This is also another government project, and it's a fairly high profile one. Um, this was around the time that the federal government, Congress passed a law called the Affordable Care Act. You might have heard about it. Sort of a high visibility, you know, maybe slightly um, contentious kind of process, right? Controversial uh, legislation. And among other things, this law that got passed said that the government would build out an online healthcare marketplace where people could go shop for their medical coverage, right? And this marketplace was called healthcare.gov. That was the website, but the website was actually a huge ecosystem of applications and different providers and partners and agencies and insurance companies, right? All sort of integrating together in this giant, horrible rat's nest of government contracts and different system integrators. So I was brought in to try to build a security program and a security operations center for healthcare.gov. And it was really tough. It was really challenging, really challenging for a lot of reasons. Uh, there was a lot of pressure. All the management right, in charge of this thing, they were under a tremendous amount of scrutiny and pressure. Had a lot of different parties and, and consultancies and companies, you know, not really incentivized to work together. Now we all had to work towards this common goal. And for security, which is already kind of a challenge to get people to do what you want, <laughs> it, was, it was tough. But we were making it work. We were making it work. We were making progress slowly but surely. And one of the things that we struggled with was there was a lot of just like data, and a lot of things going on. And we had to somehow, you know, for these, these managers and these executives that were under so much pressure and they just wanted to know, is this going to be done on time? Is it going to work? Am I going to be embarrassed? Of course, the answers to that were no. Maybe, yes, definitely, you were going to be embarrassed. We didn't know that at the time. But I had this great idea. And I said, you know what? We're going about all this security reporting all wrong. I'm having to constantly explain everything that we're doing and try to make people care about it, you know, beyond listening to me for the first five minutes and then shutting me out. I'm sure you all can't relate to that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the best infographic anyone has ever created. Huge fan of infographics. I'm going to take all of this really complicated security reporting, all of this data, and I'm going to convert it to pretty pictures that they can just look at at a glance. So I got to work way, way back 
right out of high school, I, uh, I wanted to be an artist. I actually started off by, I went to design school before I took a hard left turn, hard right turn, whatever. So I reached all the way back and I was like pulling out all my like kind of design principles and I was building out this infographic. And I remember it had like a thermometer in the middle, a thermometer graphic because healthcare, get it, right? thermometer and then all these different shapes. And I was like, well, you know, we encountered this many software flaws, this many code level vulnerabilities. And, uh, you know, here's how we're doing on the risk assessments. And all that translates to these colors and percentages and charts. And I spent like weeks on this thing. Everybody on my team loved it. That looks tremendous. You really, they're going to like that. And I remember I had this meeting with our kind of government uh, oversight proudly you know, pulled up my infographic and I was like, well, let me just explain it to you. And I think it took me about five seconds before I and my infographic got ripped to shreds. This happened because I got a little too abstract with all of my figures, right? It didn't make sense. I took some of those very technical kind of quantitative risk analysis sort of things and I just started converting them to qualitative things. Well, we found 30 really bad vulnerabilities. So I'm gonna make that a red. What does that mean? Is that bad? If I see red, does that mean everything's about to die and spontaneously combust or are we somewhat okay? I was taking qualitative measures and I was arbitrarily like adding numbers so that I could then do math with those numbers and make you know graphics that aligned to that. By the way, that's also nonsense. You can't do that. Right? Completely arbitrary. So what I learned here, sometimes it's necessary to summarize security reporting and technical information. We have to summarize it with graphics and shapes and colors, and that's okay. It's, in fact, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. But be careful not to get too abstract. It has to be meaningful. Don't forget you need to have the math and the data to back up what you're showing. Don't confuse qualitative measures, colors, shapes, groupings with quantitative measures, numbers and amounts of things and percentages, right? When you start mixing those things up, the math quickly becomes meaningless and you're gonna create more confusion than you're addressing. Last lesson I learned, infographics are so cool. I don't care what anyone says. I'll die on that hill, whatever. You won't die alone. I won't die alone. I'll, I'll, I'll come up with a good one, you'll see. Okay, now the biggest fail of all, fail number nine, you failed to show value. You didn't answer the all important question, why are you even here? Why do I pay you? What are you doing for the organization? Okay. Now this happened, my second startup experience where I was building out that threat hunting service. And we had a few engagements, a few customers, where I had some really skilled people in those environments looking for bad things. And these people knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing. But they would spend all this time and they weren't finding any incidents. They would have their check-in calls with the customer and say, you know what, we looked, we didn't see anything. And the customer is like, I don't even know whether I can trust you. Is that because you didn't know what you were doing? Is that because you didn't look in the right place or for the right thing? I don't know what you're doing for me. That became a big issue for this brand new service that we were trying to get off the ground, this new company that we were trying to build. Okay. So I quickly learned in that scenario, turns out demonstrating the value of security is hard. It's like demonstrating the value of insurance, right? You don't know how badly it's needed until bad things happen and you have done the work to, to get that in place, right? But we have to provide some kind of empirical evidence that the security that you're providing, whatever that looks like, is effective, that it's necessary, that you're giving the right amount of whatever you're getting paid to produce. In my situation for this threat hunting startup, you know, we decided very early on and very quickly, based on those interactions, that, hey, you know what? We need to start adding a lot more reporting to what we're doing. We need to start letting the customer know, hey, guess what? I didn't find any you know, big bad incidents in your environment. But I found some gaps in your data. I found some things that you could be doing better. 
So let's work on those, right? Found some informational kind of things. There were some uh, vulnerable versions of iTunes in QuickTime. No, not really, right? Some things that you should probably address, even though, you know, that's not precisely what you're paying us for. We still found some other things, right? We can be helpful that way. We'll do some advising, some informational reports, okay? You have to show that value. You have to answer that question. Why are you here? Why do I care? If you're not doing that, you're not going to last long, whatever kind of security you're doing. And then my final fail, number 10, failure to tell a good story. And this one, I don't tie to any one experience or one job, because this is one that I've taken 20 years to learn. In a lot of ways, I'm still learning it. Our success in security, you can have the best people, you can be the best. Many people in this room are the best, arguably. I'm also here. But if you're not telling a good story around what you're doing or what your team is doing, you're risking whatever success you can bring to that team or to the organization. You have to be able to construct a compelling narrative. You have to take a bunch of this jargon, really high concept, kind of ephemeral things like cyber attacks, and construct a narrative around how you're helping to manage that risk, how you're helping to keep those things from happening or to respond very quickly and effectively when they do happen. Okay? And especially as security leaders, our success in many cases comes down to our ability to tell that good story. So what I always tell students, what I tell uh, mentees, you know, really think about whoever you're talking to, think about what they care about. Get out of your head for a minute. Right? Come up with an elevator pitch, whether it's an elevator pitch for the project that you're working on, an elevator pitch for the service you're delivering, an elevator pitch just for you. Right? If you have five minutes to tell me, what is this all about? Why should I care? Take all that security jargon that we love so much, right? remove that from your vocabulary for five minutes. Come up with some kind of narrative, a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Maybe a surprise here and there, right? This is one instance where surprises are okay. And cover less for greater impact. Something I've so clearly failed on this evening, but it's really important. If you want someone to care, a lot of times in security, we think, all right, I'm going to explain why this threat is such a problem. And it all started back with you know, the first computers when they were first invented. And I'm going to lead you all throughout history up until the point where you got a phishing email, right? We don't need to tell the entire story. We don't need to fall on our face. We need to cover less for greater impact. Pick the few things that really matter. Focus on those, okay? So in summary, right? Failure isn't the end. It's the beginning. If you're like me, it's a beginning over and over and over again. You've got constant renewal. Right, because you're constantly making mistakes and hopefully learning from those mistakes. You know, evaluate what you're doing constantly. Seek feedback from others, from your team, from your constituents, your clients, your bosses. Know when to yield to it or know when you may really believe in what you're doing. You just have to tell a slightly better story around it. With that, we are done. Thank you very much for attending. I appreciate it. Have a great night.